The Corova Milk Bar sold Milk Plus, Milk Plus Velocet, or Sintamesk, or Drencrum, which is what we were drinking. This would sharpen you up and make you ready for a bit of the old ultraviolence. Welcome back to Essential Art House. Remember me? The true crime lover and David Fincher obsessor who brought you our Essential Art House video on M by Fritz Lang? Well, hello my droogs, I'm back. This time to take you deep into the ultraviolent world of Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. Now, we could and probably will talk about most of Stanley Kubrick's filmography at some point in our series. So why did I pick A Clockwork Orange to be our second Kubrick film? Personally, it's one of my favorites of his films. But from a film perspective, it remains one of the most controversial films of all time, and in my opinion, also one of the most misunderstood. <laughs> We're not little children, are we, Georgie boy? After the surprisingly lukewarm reception to 2001 A Space Odyssey, which had a slow-moving and complex production, aka huge budget, Kubrick was pressured to prove he could make a successful film with a much smaller budget. Thus, A Clockwork Orange was born. Funnily enough, this low-budget film was followed up by Barry Lyndon, another epic. Based on the novel A Clockwork Orange, written by Anthony Burgess in 1962, I'm well aware of the faults of the novel. The film follows Alex DeLarge and his gang of droogs through a dystopian future as they commit horrifying acts of violence against those around them, doing whatever they please. Eventually, Alex is sent to prison and subsequently is selected to be a test subject in a new psychological conditioning experiment meant to get rid of his violent tendencies. The experiment is viewed as a success and Alex is dumped back into society with his new, much less violent persona. I don't want to completely spoil the ending for anyone who hasn't seen it, but personally, I think it's very satisfying. Alex is also our not-so-humble narrator for most of the film, and the world as we see it is through his perspective. After a trial with judges and a jury, and some very hard words spoken against your friend and humble narrator, he was sentenced to 14 years in Stager number 84F among smelly perverts and hardened prestupniks. When this film was released in the US in 1972, it was immediately given an X rating. With some minor tweaking, Kubrick was able to get it down to an R rating. But in the UK, the film was banned in 1973 for inciting violence in the public. Due to Kubrick's own wishes, the film remained banned in the UK until his death in 1999. But I think that by today's standards, the film is a lot more mild than it's often tagged as. Take a director like Quentin Tarantino. He does tend to ham it up and exaggerate his violence to an extent, making blood unrealistically red and a lot of blood. But the gore is very much in your face and excessive. Kind of like a clockwork orange. According to Tarantino, that first 20 minutes is pretty fucking perfect. It's about as poppy and visceral and perfect a piece of cinema movie making as I think had ever been done up until that time. Safe to say, he loves this movie. Tarantino has even said that stuck in the middle scene of Reservoir Dogs. was partly inspired by this scene. And I'm happy. To me, the violence in A Clockwork Orange is much less in your face and even less graphic than the violence in just about any Tarantino film. Kubrick goes about the violence in a sort of artful way, choosing to cut around the most horrific acts. And to anyone who thinks this film is Kubrick's most sexual, I implore you to go watch Eyes Wide Shut. Come on with a rain. Malcolm McDowell's performance as Alex is what truly brings the character to life. The images we have forever stuck in our brain are probably of Alex waving around a large penis sculpture, or torturing a couple while singing Gene Kelly, or drinking milk in a bowler hat and white jumpsuit. Heath Ledger even noted that he took inspiration from McDowell's performance while he was perfecting his role as the Joker. 
Alex is a complex character. Often seen as single-minded, he's actually a very intelligent young man with an appreciation for the arts, especially classical music. You've heard Beethoven before? Yes! So you're keen on music? Yes! Even his evil acts are artful to some extent. He heavily connects the pleasure he derives from violence to the pleasure he derives from listening to Beethoven, using musical language to artfully describe his atrocious acts. Because he's clearly the smartest and most cultured of his droogs, he's taken it upon himself to be their leader. And yes, he's unapologetically violent. But did you maybe feel some amount of sympathy for Alex after the experiment works and he's no longer his normal self? Or after he himself becomes a victim of violence? This shows us that he's the perfect example of an anti-hero. Many popular shows and films feature an anti-hero. Look at Walter White, or Tony Soprano, or Dexter Morgan, or even Don Draper. We love a bad guy with the occasional redeemable quality, and Alex is certainly one of them. Their minds study of robbers, and their lips speak deceit. We don't even necessarily understand Alex or his motives, but that's partly what makes us so fascinated. A lot of this film is about the psychology behind attempting to condition the mind, aka what happens to Alex, and whether that should be accepted as moral or not, even when exacted upon the most horrific criminals. I'm not going to fall deep down the psychology hole here, but it is a key point. Alex might be a sociopath, but we still don't actually want to see him lose to the machine. The title itself, A Clockwork Orange, means to appear natural and organic on the outside, but to be mechanical on the inside. After Alex is deprived of his violent tendencies, he is nothing but a shell of his old self. His new inner self is just another cog in the machine. So is it right for an entity to decide who someone gets to be, to condition them to fit into society just how they want them? I think that's something everyone has to think about themselves and decide how they feel. I'm not going to pretend to have some profound answer to it all, especially in the context of this film. It's something you'll just have to ponder the next time you watch. It's no good sitting there in hope, my little brothers. Even for this being his low-budget film, A Clockwork Orange still holds up to the level of filmmaking we expect from Kubrick. Although some of his typical style is evident in this movie, a la slow zooms, widely framed shots, and the Kubrick stare, there is something that feels a little different about this one. The cinematography is much more fantastical. Along with the juxtaposition of Alex singing show tunes while kicking a victim, the film uses slow motion to juxtapose a sort of airy fantasy against the brutality of the action. Alright. I've said a lot already, and there's a lot more you could unpack about A Clockwork Orange, so I very much recommend that you do some scouring of the internet because there is so much great content outside of just this video. You could truly spend all day trying to understand and interpret this film. I can talk your ear off about my own interpretation, but at the end of the day, this film easily proves Kubrick's autorability. No matter the budget, his films are quickly distinguishable as Kubrick films, even the ones that aren't an epic. A Clockwork Orange is hardly disputable as culturally relevant. Look at its mark in hit TV shows and movies. To me, all of this is what makes A Clockwork Orange an essential art house film.